Hello world, this is Craig. Today I wanted to look at some of the real world aspects of I squared C interface. So what we're looking at here is a logic probe and we can see that there's a transmission on the I squared C bus about every 200 milliseconds. So each of these uh, downward spikes is a transmission between the master and the slave. If we zoom in and we look at say the first set, this is a complete communication between the master and the slave and there's some characteristics of this that are critical for uh, correct transfer of this information. And particularly if you're doing bit banging rather than using a UART to send out this information. So this isn't meant to be a tutorial on I squared C, but it's a few just reminders of things that I'll mention. Uh, the first is that I squared C is a two wire interface plus a ground. So there's one data and one clock line. The data is called the SDA, serial data, and the clock is SCL, serial clock. And on our logic probe, we have the serial clock connected to channel zero at the top, and we have the serial data connected to channel one, which is the second line. We also have uh, the analog versions of the same signals, so basically the raw data of the uh, serial clock and the serial data uh, on the two traces at the bottom. They're useful to watch in case we're getting a, a, a false start or we're getting some kind of a glitch that maybe one of the slaves is reading as a clock pulse or something else is messing up. So it's just good to watch the analog data to make sure that nothing unexpected isn't happening. So all of the components on the bus are open collector or open drain, which means that they can only pull the bus to a logic low. And the signals otherwise have pull-up resistors. So if nobody is actively pulling the signals low, they just float high. So we can see that as this starts, the two signals, the serial clock and the serial data, are both at logic high. One of the things to remember with I squared C is that information is always transferred in bytes. And for the very first signal that comes along after what we'll call the start condition, the first seven bits of that first byte are the address of the target device. There's also 10-bit addressing, but almost everything that we're going to see is 7-bit addressing, and we'll talk about 10-bit maybe a little bit later, but right now we're presuming that this is going to be a 7-bit address. The eighth bit in this first byte is the data direction bit or it's a read-write bit or read-not-write bit. If that is set to logic one, it means that after we finish this first byte, we're going to read from whoever we've addressed. And if it's set to logic zero, it means that after this first byte, we're going to start writing to whoever we've addressed. And then every byte is followed by a ninth clock strobe, which is controlled by the master. And that is the opportunity for the receiver of the data to acknowledge that it received that command properly. So let's look at this first byte that we're sending out in detail. So as I mentioned, we're logic high, both the serial clock and the data are logic one, uh, waiting for something to happen. And suddenly an unusual event happens. And this is something that can only happen under two conditions. And that event is when the serial data line changes state while the serial clock is at logic one. And so we can see that in this first condition, the serial data line is going from true to false, high to low, while the clock is at logic one. This only happens one other time and that's at the stop condition. So when all of the items on the bus see this happen, they see this condition of the clock being high while the serial data line falls, they know it's time to wake up, come out of whatever sleep state they might be in, and they need to start paying attention to the bus because it means that an address is going to be coming down the bus. So this is called the start condition, and it's just a separate uh, condition. And if you're, if you're bit banging this, you have to make sure that you do that properly. So the first seven bits that are transferred are going to be the address of who the master wants to communicate with. And it's seven bits. So in this case, it's two. And so we see that there's one, 
two, three, four, five, six, seven bits. And so that was a, a address two is who we want to talk to. The next bit that comes along is again controlled by the master and it is this read write bit. So in this case, it's zero. So it's logic low right here. When, when that clock transition goes up, the data is at a logic zero. So the slave is going to clock that in as a logic zero and say, this is going to be a write command. So I have been selected and the master is now going to write things to me. This ninth clock strobe is an opportunity for the device that received this message to acknowledge that it was received properly. And so if this is logic low, when this clock strobe goes high, then that's an acknowledge. It means that the receiver has properly received and decoded that address and it's now prepared to do whatever happens next. If this is logic one, meaning that nobody pulled down the bus, and so the receiver, the intended receiver, didn't pull down the bus and nobody else pulled down the bus, that is a NAC with an N, N-A-K. And that means it's not acknowledged. Nobody acknowledged receiving that message. It may be that the slave was busy. It may be that that slave didn't exist. The address is wrong. For some reason, nobody acknowledged that it's going to act on that command. So at that point, the master can either try again. Uh, he can just continue on, but it's up to the master and the code in the master to decide what to do if he has received a knack with an N rather than acknowledge of that byte. So after the addressing byte comes through, we start with the data. And so we can see we have a little protocol decoder here and he shows us that following the first byte, we have, uh, we're writing to the slave a zero. And so these are all just, here's our clock strobes coming along and we have eight clock strobes and then the ninth clock strobe is, again, the acknowledge that whoever received this message acknowledged that it received all eight bytes okay. And so it's okay to continue. So the master then goes ahead and starts the next one. And something a little unusual happens in this one. It's called clock stretching. So we can see what's happened is we're now doing the, the second byte that's being sent to the slave. And the master got in one, two, three, four, five, six bits of this message. And it took the clock low. And something interesting happened was when the master released the clock, meaning it should go back high again and strobe in the next nibble, or the, I'm sorry, and strobe, strobe in the next bit, the clock didn't go high. The slave in this case held the clock low because it needed to stretch out the clock. It wasn't ready for the, it wasn't ready to give up the next bit. So sometimes slaves will do this little by little between each clock pulse, they might stretch them out just a little bit if it has to have something uh, to do, or maybe it's just not as, as quick. But in this case, maybe an interrupt came along or it had to do an analog to digital conversion. But for some reason, this device was not ready to give the last bit. And so it stretched out the clock pulse. And this is perfectly acceptable. Not all slaves can do clock stretching. It's optional. Uh, and some slaves may not even have a transistor connected, connected to the clock. They may not be able to pull the clock low and do clock stretching. But if they can do clock stretching, that's that's absolutely acceptable to the, uh, the master. The master, just like everybody else on the bus, will only clock things in on a rising clock pulse. And so it will sit there and wait for the slave to let go of the clock. It won't wait forever. It's up to however it was coded, but it will wait for some period of time. Then this message go ahead and is completed. It gets the last bit, it then uh, transfers the acknowledge that it was received okay. Then we have the second uh, unusual condition, which is the stop, where the serial data changes state after the serial clock is raised to logic one. So again, this is only the second time that this condition can happen. One is when it's a start condition, and one is when it's a stop condition. 
the entire period between the start condition and the stop condition, the bus is considered busy. And this master has authority of the bus. Now, if, if this master wants to retain authority of the bus and not release it after it has transmitted this message, it can do a, a, a restart or it can do a repeat start condition, in which case it avoids doing the stop condition and it redoes a start condition by uh, getting the clock high and then pulling the serial data low. And that indicates to any other one, any other bus master that uh, the bus is still busy and this master is going to do a, a additional transfer. So in our protocol decoder, we can see over here uh, the messages that are going back and forth. We have a setup write to address two, which is uh, followed by an acknowledge, and this is what we just watched. We then have a setup write to address two, uh, which is a different register, it's register zero, followed by an acknowledge. Then we're going to set up a read to this device. And this is where another interesting thing happens. In this particular read, the master is intending to read four bytes from the slave. So it sets up a read, and we know that the difference between the read and the write, if we look here where a read is being set up, we have our address again. So here's uh, the seven bits of the address, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Those are the seven bits of the address, address two. And then unlike the last time where we were doing a write to the slave. This time we're doing a read to the slave. So if we look at the eighth bit, we're now at logic high. We were at logic low be before. So we're at logic high telling the slave that we're going to do a read. There's a little bit of clock stretching and then we get finally a acknowledge from the slave saying, okay, I'm ready to do this read. We then do the three bits of the read or the three bytes of the read without unusual events. We get the first byte with an acknowledge, the second byte with an acknowledge, the third byte with an acknowledge, and then we do the fourth byte. And this, the master knows, is the last byte it's going to read. But something interesting has happened. Now keep in mind that the master is the receiver in this case, and so it's the one that's controlling the acknowledge at the end. So it's not only doing the ninth clock strobe, it's doing the ninth data bit as well, telling the sender, the slave in this case, that it's receiving those those uh, uh, bytes okay. And if the receiver were to get a knack, there could be some intelligence built in that the next time it would resend the same byte or there'd be some something that both the master and the slave would need to know what's happening, but it gives an indication to the receiver that maybe something went wrong. But the last byte received by the master is an exception. The master knows that this is the last byte, and so rather than send an acknowledge, it sends a not acknowledge, it sends a knack with an N. And this is a special case. The reason it has to send a knack instead of an ack is if it sent the acknowledge, the device doing the transmitting, the slave in this case, would automatically start putting the next bit onto the data bus. And it could get into a condition where uh, the master then, and without, without doing an illegal protocol, would have to read that next byte from the bus. And in this case, it doesn't want to read another byte. It's, it's read all the bytes at once. So the only way that the master can get out of this relationship without just abandoning it uh, or without doing an invalid uh, strobe is to actually send a knack and then it is allowed to do a stop condition. So you'll see this and quite often people will think that maybe something is wrong because the, on the last byte, it received a knack instead of an acknowledge, that's, that's not unusual. Whenever the data is going from a slave to the master, the last byte that's sent will be a knack and not a, an acknowledge. One thing that can happen if you don't have a logic probe where you can actually see what's going on and these addresses going out, 
one of the most common issues with I squared C is you send things out onto the bus and you don't get a response. So one thing that can go wrong, I'll show you here with our uh, uh, Kyle compiler. We use the compile the Kyle tool chain, and one thing to keep in mind is the address of the thing that you're talking to, the slave out there that you want to talk to. Should that be left justified or should it be right justified? We know it's a seven bit address and we know that when it's sent across the I squared C, it's left justified. So the most significant bit is the first bit of the address and the least significant bit is the read write bit. But the question is how do you give it to your library or however you're sending it out? And in our case, we're using the uh, STM32 F4 with the HAL library. So the hardware abstraction layer and we have in here the definition for in this case the pressure switch address which is two and we do a left rotate on that so when we look at the code and we think about the address of the device we're thinking about it in its physical address but because of the way the compiler library works uh, it's going to expect that address to be left justified we can see that by looking at the defines here in the uh, I squared C uh, header file. So here's the seven bit address write and the seven bit address read macros. And, and we can see that what this is going to do, if we bring over and we look at this value, the I squared C OAR1 ADD0, we can see that that is simply uh, a one. So it has the least significant bit set. So what this macro is going to do is it's going to take whatever address we give it and it's immediately going to set the least significant bit to either a zero or one, depending if it wants to uh, write or read that, that uh, slave. So that's just a, a little bit of caution to check into your library. If you're not getting a response from the slave that you think you should be getting, Check into your library, see if maybe that should be left justified or right justified. Maybe it's overriding. And so instead of uh, thinking that you're sending an address, uh, you're actually, you need to roll it one to the left to actually send the proper address. Well, those are just some things that we wanted to mention on the I squared C uh, bus. Maybe some things that when you first start getting it going and connecting it, uh, you see some odd behavior. Uh, probably it may not actually be very odd behavior. So we'll see you next time. Thanks for watching.